NBA draft workouts are some of the most interesting things when it comes to the actual NBA draft process because we get a pretty good feel on which teams are looking at which prospects. However, there are quite a few variables from an outside perspective when it comes to draft workouts. For example, some teams love to flaunt and share every single prospect that they're bringing in the building, which kind of creates this cloud of smoke of, hey, who are we really looking at? We're bringing all of these different guys into the building for either individual workouts or group workouts, and we're doing our due diligence to the point where nobody really knows which singular prospect or prospects in general that team is targeting closely and then some teams literally treat the information of who's in the building like it's FBI code that they can't part with and uh, because of that they're radio silent when it comes to who's actually been in the building and who hasn't been so because of that I have a lot of information about some teams some information about some teams and then literally zero information about a few of them as well so it makes this time of year super fun, especially for my NBA mock drafts. Make sure to check out the most recent one on the channel. But we're going to talk about three of the most interesting teams from their draft workouts that we've seen so far and kind of what it could potentially mean. There's been a lot of coverage on these teams. I'm very excited to discuss them a little bit further in this video and really break down what I think their workouts mean for these individual teams and who they could draft on Thursday this week as we are within one week of the actual NBA draft at this point. So jumping into our first team, we're looking at the Portland Trailblazers who currently hold the third overall pick in the 2023 NBA draft. They also hold the 23rd pick in this year's draft as well. So the Blazers have two first round selections, Mike Schmitz, I think a really smart mind when it comes to prospect evaluation, typically a, a person who I found myself in alignment with uh, quite a bit back when he was an analyst for ESPN. Currently, uh, there's not a ton of other analysts that I find myself in frequent alignment with. That's what really made him stand out to me. And of course, now he's the assistant GM of the Portland Trailblazers. I think he hit a home run in last year's draft with Shaden Sharp when they selected him seventh overall. And now the Blazers are in a spot third overall, and that's really the pick that we need to focus on for this video and who they've had in the building and what that could potentially mean for this organization. I wanna highlight some of Mike Schmidt's relationship with these prospects as well at some point, but let's start about who they've had in the building and kind of the order that they've actually had them in there. First off, they had Amen and Alsar Thompson in for a joint workout with the organization. They got both of the twins in the building on the same day. And it's definitely a unique situation for Portland uh, to have them in there because last year you think about who they drafted in Shaden Sharp, very athletic, unproven kid, hadn't played any college basketball. And yet Mike Schmitz was very high on him uh, and actually kind of leaked his own board before being hired by the Portland Trailblazers talking about how Shane Sharp was a prospect he would have a lot of interest in in Portland's situation and of course they went on to take him and I think Mike Schmidt's relationship with Amin Thompson he's done film studies with him he's been up close and personal and watched him a ton in person and I think that's going to have an interesting effect on this year's draft just given the fact that Amin Thompson, I think, is a high priority for Portland, and I think the draft history in terms of drafting athletic, freakish guards with good size, I know it's only one year of history, but it's an important note in this entire process. And then, of course, they brought in Scoot Henderson, who had a fantastic workout with the Portland Trailblazers as well. He really set himself up uh, to be the number one guy in Portland's eyes to the point where they are not looking to trade the number three overall pick anymore at this point from my intel on the situation. There were, was discussion inside the organization about trading that asset for an all NBA caliber player for an all-star level caliber player. Those talks are not ongoing anymore at this point is my understanding of the situation. And Portland, third overall, they're sitting now in a spot uh, where they're going to have their choice of at least one of Scoot Henderson or Amon Thompson. And then to complicate matters even more, they actually brought Brandon Miller in for a workout on June 16th, very late in the process. I think that's very important to note. 
and Mike Schmitz does have a significantly lesser relationship that was pre-existing before this draft process with Brandon Miller compared to his relationship with Amon Thompson. So I think there's a lot of things at play here. I think the Blazers, if their own board were to get leaked, of course, Wembenyama would be at the top of it, no surprise. But I think Scoot Henderson would be strongly in position number two. Then I think that Amon Thompson and Brandon Miller are a lot closer than people would think. And in fact, Amon Thompson would be number three on the board from my current understanding of the situation. That's the way that I see it. His workout with the Portland Trail Blazers was fantastic. Throughout this, you've been seeing footage of these workouts and, and exactly what the Blazers brass uh, and lead decision makers are getting to see up close and personal there in their facility. And I think the Blazers are in a spot where going with Amon Thompson, maybe a little bit less of a fit next to Damian Lillard, but with Mike Schmitz and Joe Cronin being under contract with the organization for the long haul, I think the Blazers are more focused on setting themselves up for the next 10 to 15 years of Portland basketball than they are for the next one or two years. I think that's a home run decision for them if they do stick that way. And I think Amon Thompson is going to be very likely the selection on draft night for the Portland Trail Blazers. And you might be saying, wait a minute, I thought you said Scoot Henderson was firmly number two on their board behind Victor Wembanyama, and that is what I said. But the issue is there's a team picking ahead of them, and that is the Charlotte Hornets, who have actually just recently been sold by Michael Jordan at a $1.77 billion mark, which was a $3 billion valuation on the franchise. High valuation, and ultimately, the Hornets, there's been a lot of back and forth discussion. Jonathan Gavoni's really been the lead dog when it comes to discussing the possibility of Brandon Miller going second overall to the Charlotte Hornets, but he has backed off that recently. Remember, I've never transitioned to that thought process, to that kind of brain drain of ideology that somehow Brandon Miller was going to leapfrog Scoot Henderson. Just recently, Jonathan Gavoni said that he believed Brandon Miller, based on talent, was worthy of the second overall selection. I did not believe that. I still haven't believed that. Now with the Hornets bringing both Brandon Miller and Scoot Henderson into the building, I have reports that the Charlotte Hornets preferred the workout of Scoot Henderson. And it might not sound like a ton preferring the workout, but if you look at Mitch Kupchak, his draft history, typically guys who perform well in the facility, in the pre-draft process, typically that has led to some pretty high draft selections. And I think because of that, we can currently look at Scoot Henderson to be, as we initially projected eight, nine, 10 months ago, Scoot Henderson is going to be the second overall selection in the 2023 NBA draft. And he will be going to the Charlotte Hornets amidst some rumors, yes, that a potential Brandon Ingram trade to the Charlotte Hornets for pick number two, maybe Zion Williamson. There's all these rumors right now. I think realistically what that is signifying is that Charlotte went into this process considering fit very strongly around LaMelo Ball. And I think off of that, they're now at a spot where they didn't feel like Brandon Miller, despite being maybe a, a solid fit, was a high enough talent level to warrant that type of selection. So now they're at a crossroads of wondering, okay, does Scoot fit? Or do we trade this pick? And I think that they like the talent enough on Scoot Henderson that they're gonna stick there and select him second overall in the 2023 NBA draft, which then remember pushes Amin Thompson third to the Portland Trailblazers, which leaves the Houston Rockets likely with Brandon Miller. Uh, at this point in the process, I'm kind of crystallizing on that idea that one is Victor, two is Scoot Henderson, three is Amen Thompson, and four is Brandon Miller. Something I've talked about at length over the last few months as a realistic possibility as everyone was pushing Brandon Miller up the board. I actually slid him down mine when it came to the NBA draft. And at this point, I feel very confident uh, in that playing out correctly. You, know, never, you never know, draft night always can throw you for a loop, but I feel very confident in my current projection. And then the final team I wanna really focus on in this video is the Indiana Pacers who have not one, not two, but three first round picks in this year's draft. They also have a pick at 32 and a pick at 55. And if we're gonna discuss a franchise not taking any days off and doing their homework, 
The Indiana Pacers are really the lead example of that. Seemingly, they've had every single draft prospect in this year's class in the building this offseason. It just is ridiculous how many people that they've actually had in there for workouts. It just seems like there's a workout every single day. Um, and if I had to say that they had 70 plus prospects in the building, I might be underselling how many prospects have actually been in there. Uh, and it's an impressive feat. They're working really hard to make sure that they nail this draft, which is a really good philosophy. I think more teams need to work as hard as the Pacers are this offseason. So if you're a Pacers fan, you have to feel pretty good about how this process is currently unfolding. And I think really there's a few things to discuss in this one. Uh, I want to start actually with the picks in the 20s, 26 and 29, and also 32. I think three picks that are in, interesting and kind of important to talk about. The Pacers actually did one workout that's really rare to see, and it was actually a dual workout. Now I talked about that with Osar Thompson and Amen Thompson earlier. That makes sense because they're twin brothers, kind of flying together, traveling together for these pre-draft workouts. The Pacers hosted a dual workout between Mojave King of G League Ignite and Ryan Rupert from the New Zealand Breakers, who's a French-born prospect. And it's very rare to see just only two prospects kind of working out at the same time, in the building at the same time. Typically, we see a higher number, six, sometimes eight prospects. We only saw two in the building that day for the Indiana Pacers. Again, Mojave King, who is a, a pretty good shooter, Definitely an athletic freak who had a really good combine for himself and should be on team's radar in the 30. So I think pick 32, you could look at Mojave King as a legitimate possibility at that spot. And then Ryan Rupert, uh, someone who I've been consistently mocking in the 20s throughout this entire draft process, even going back to my way too early mock, I believe I had him mocked somewhere in the 20s. Um, you might have to fact check me on that, but Ryan Rupert, at 26 or 29, I do think makes some sense. The Pacers are heavily invested in improving their defense, specifically from the wing spot, Ryan Rupert, one of the better draft prospects in general defensively. Now, I think there's another important note to talk about. In one of those six prospect workouts, they had a collection of second round guys in the building, and they also had Leonard Miller in the building that same day. Five of the prospects were guys who I would probably give second round grades or undrafted grades to. And then Leonard Miller is a strong first round grade in my eyes. And the fact that they had him in with those other prospects that day points to me that it's a potential move up option. Then they wanted to kind of get the lay of the land on how much better Leonard Miller potentially is than some of those second round guys. And I think he stood out during that pre-draft process, that pre-draft workout with the Pacers. So I think if the Pacers were to move up from 26 and 29, they have a good kind of eye test and, and background test on what Leonard Miller looks like against some of the other prospects in this draft. And at six foot 10, really good rebounder, very productive for G League Ignite this past year. He's a guy that I think not only fits Indiana, but he'd also be really opportunistic, doesn't have to have the ball in his hands to score, but has some really intriguing upside factors that you could maybe buy into if you're a Pacers fan. And I think he's a name to watch, but let's conclude with the most important selection that the Indiana Pacers possess on draft night, and that is pick number seven. There's been some rumors that maybe they want to trade out of that selection. I don't believe that. Now, I think if a deal for OG Ananobi became available, where it's pick seven and maybe one other or two other smaller draft assets, the Pacers would express interest in that. But assuming OG Ananobi is either traded to a different team, say a New Orleans Pelicans or a Memphis Grizzlies, the Pacers aren't going to overbid for him. They know what they have to offer. They're going to be very firm in their price, and they're not just going to throw pick seven into the wind. And because of that, I think that they're doing their homework very diligently on who to select at pick number seven. They've had a bunch of different players in for individual work. And those four players, Cam Whitmore, Taylor Hendricks, Jairus Walker, and most recently, Grady Dick from Kansas. A lot of interesting names, okay, for different players. And there's a lot of differences between these guys. Cam Whitmore, kind of that physical wing type who can drive downhill, score the basketball at the rim, uh, very strong, very physically dominant. Now, my understanding currently with how the NBA draft's going to play out is that Cam Whitmore is going to be off the board 
before pick number seven, whether that's to the Detroit Pistons at five, which it sounds most likely to me at this point, or number six to Orlando if he were to fall. But Indiana does have some backup plans, which is why it's very good that they're doing all of this uh, diligent work and having guys in the facility as frequently as they are because they have pretty good understanding of some of these other prospects. And I think the most important thing to point out here is the fact that they had two of these guys in the building on the very same day. And it's almost like they were testing one against the other. Now, they weren't in at the exact same time. This was not a dual workout. This was two individual workouts on the same day. So they wanted to have both of them in simultaneously, essentially, without being in there simultaneously, if that makes sense. Taylor Hendricks was in there first thing in the morning. They had a really good workout with him. He flashed a lot of his athleticism, his shot making, and kind of the overall package on what I believe would be not only a fantastic fit off of Tyrese Halliburton, but also a really good fit next to Miles Turner. I think he would help kind of hide some of Buddy Heald's defensive limitations. And I talked about Indiana really badly needing to address the defensive side of the floor, specifically from a forward spot. I think Taylor Hendricks is about as good as it gets in this year's draft in that regard, but they also did bring in Jairus Walker that same day, and he flashed some of his ball skills, some of the things that he does very well, uh, that's a little bit different than Taylor Hendricks. He's got a more refined mid-range jump shot, a little bit more touch, well, quite a bit more touch even, I'd say. Can handle the ball a little bit better than Taylor Hendricks. Now, I think his three-point shooting's significantly worse, and I also do think that his defensive rim protection I think is significantly lesser as well. So Indiana, they have some tough questions ahead of them, but I think pick seven is one of the most fascinating picks in this year's draft because realistically, it's possible that, possible that Cam Whitmore and Taylor Hendricks are both off the board, five and six respectively, leaving Jairus Walker right there for the picking for the Indiana Pacers, but it's also very possible that maybe Walker goes earlier. And I think the Pacers here have set themselves up in a spot where knowing that Wembenyama goes one, Scoot probably goes second, Amon Thompson goes in the top three, at worst top four, Brandon Miller goes in the top four, and then we see probably Cam Whitmore off the board at five, at least one of Jairus Walker or Taylor Hendricks is going to be on the board for them at pick number seven. I think they feel really good about that long-term outcome. And if you're a Pacers fan, you gotta be very happy not only with the work that the organization's been doing to set themselves up for success, but also just the pure talent uh, that they're going to be able to get even at pick number seven. Typically, it's a, a hard kind of draft slot to find consistent talent. The Pacers are in a spot where they're gonna get consistent talent in this year's draft, as long as they don't do something crazy and draft a player that uh, I just don't see on their radar right now. But my understanding, they walk out of this draft with one of Cam Whitmore, Jairus Walker, or Taylor Hendricks. And I think it's a home run for them regardless of which prospect they get. My preference for them would be one of Cam Whitmore or Taylor Hendricks. A little bit of a spoiler to my big board, but Jairus Walker I think has a lot of talent and, and a skill set that would work really well in Indiana as well. Hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. It was a lot of fun recording talking about these three specific teams. Now, if you do have questions about other organizations, make sure to comment down below and I will try to give you as much information as I can realistically and 100% positively confirm with you uh, on what I know about the organization. Hopefully you guys did enjoy. If you did, leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content and we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.